Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Oh, hi, Tension. <laughs> my name is Eric, and I'm here. That was Michael. Yeah. And uh, we got a fucking show today. Yeah, we I, do. Can I be honest with you? I am so excited for this show. Yeah. Holy shit. So we're doing some movies. What mm-hmm. are the movies? We're going to do High Tension and Wolf Creek. Fuck. I have been waiting so long. I've been waiting so long to do both of these, and I didn't even know yeah. about both of them. Um, I've been waiting a long time to do high tension. I'd yeah. actually never seen high tension. Mm-hmm, I had. And, uh, yeah. And you were a little lackluster on it and yeah. we're going to get to that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, high tension, an awesome movie, right? High tension. Yeah. Great movie. Me, you and the ending of high tension are going to have a little chat. That's right. But we're doing high tension and, uh, we're doing Wolf Creek as uh-huh. well. So I'd like to let everyone know we're going to spoil it. Yeah. That's probably are. a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to spoil the ending of high tension cause we need to talk about mm-hmm. that fucking ending. And you know what, if you, uh, if you usually disregard this notice and you listen anyways, I'm going to say that us telling you the ending will probably ruin the film because you're going to view it way different than you yep. would a normal. It ruins, it ruins the movie. Yeah. It's a splat pack extravaganza here today. That's what we're doing today. And uh, some people are going to go, Oh, splat pack. I don't care if I hear how people get mauled. I'm mm-hmm. still going to watch it. It'll be great. But you watch it different the second time around. So at least fucking see it. So uh, you know what? You haven't seen it now. Skip, use chapters, uh, go directly to Wolf Creek. Wolf Creek, that's another spoiler one, man. We're going to spoil that movie, I would say, exactly three times. Do you have anything to add to that? No, three times sounds about right. So let's just get into high tension. I feel like I have a lot to say about high tension, although most of it is, wow, look how amazing this is. Right. Do you mind if I geek out on you for just a second? Please. We've seen uh, we've seen on the show a lot of times movies with subtitles. This is oddly the first time we've watched anything with subtitles on the second generation Apple TV. Mm -hmm. It seems like most of the time we watch stuff on subtitles, it's on your DVDs. Right. And we just play them through the Xbox and we get the nice giant subtitles. So the movie's in two, three, five to one. And I have a pro. I I don't know if I've ever told you this. A lot of the movies I enjoy with subtitles, I will often watch, I kid you not, without the subtitles Mm -hmm. because I'm a cinematography person and a lot of foreign movies I really like for the cinematography. I've seen them a bunch. I watch them without the subtitles so I can get the whole frame. It's just a it's a weird thing. And if there's stuff at the bottom of the frame, I feel like I'm missing out on something. Mm-hmm. On the new Apple TV, and especially because of the aspect ratio, we were able to watch it with these tiny subtitles so I could see every brilliant fucking pixel of this movie. Mm-hmm. I am so excited about that. So who's the dude? Who made this? This is Alexander Aha's first film. It's also, I think, the first one that he actually had anything to do with the writing of. Sure. Oh, uh, we talked about him when we did The Hills Have Eyes. We talked about him when we did P2. Yeah. He also did uh, Piranha 3D, which came out over summertime. And uh, he's involved with another Kiefer Sutherland movie that no one's allowed Doing to Doing lots about. of stuff. Doing yeah. lots of stuff. Busy guy. And this has to be, of the, um, of the people we've talked about in the infamous Splat Pack, mm-hmm. we should go ahead just once more for recognition's sake. Yeah. We're talking about Mr. Robert Zombie. Yes. We're talking about Eli Roth. Uh-huh. Who else is in this glorious splat pack? Well, Neil Marshall, Doomsday, sure. Descent, Dog Soldiers. Excellent. Uh, the Saw Guys, the yeah. James Wan and the Leigh McNeil or whatever his name is. And Darren Lynn Bowsman. And then Darren Bowsman, yeah. who's the third Saw guy. Yeah, right. Uh, who also did Repo, which we talked about on the show. Which is oddly probably not a splat pack film. Right. But while we're talking about stuff like Doomsday, we might as well just throw Repo mm-hmm. in there too. Alex Aha, who is High Tension, and Greg McLean, who is Wolf Creek. But Alex Aha, of all of them, I think is the poster child for super gore. Oh my if God, I can, if so I can go ahead brutal. and say that. For people who may be familiar with some of the other stuff we've covered and just kind of veered away from the foreign stuff, the Splat Pack is essentially the foreign extension of old school American horror. Mm-hmm. And that's not always true. We've had a lot of things that counteract that right away. Um, we have stuff like Saw, lots of sequels. We have The Hills Have Eyes, clearly a remake. And we have this movie, which is foreign. Yeah. So uh, while it's not a Japanese one, it is Mirrors is a Japanese one. Yeah, so there. It doesn't count. It does not count uh, fulfilling the old school American horror genre classification. 
However, if you're into that stuff, this is the shit right here. Mm-hmm. This is completely it. And Alexander's stuff especially is just so much more brutal than everything. It is yeah, so it is. fucking brutal. And that's really what I want to focus on is that brutality today because I feel like high tension, it just needs to be applauded. It's so hard for the brutality and the way it treats that. And especially when you start watching a lot of horror movies, you become immune to the gimmicks. Yep. You just start, well, maybe it's just us, but I don't know. We're watching these things and we're reading into how they're done and we're looking at uh, when they cut away. Yeah, right. When they cut away, when they choose not to cut away, what they're trying to tell us. And so much of it is looking at something and say, that's an effective scare shot. Well, good job for that. You dropped a car from the, you know, the top of the frame. Mm-hmm. We can look at it. We can say that would be really scary, but very rarely are we caught off guard. All throughout high tension, you can attest to this. I was squealing yep. and throwing stuff around and it was <laughs> upsetting me greatly. It's not even so much scare shots, just stuff that makes my body twist into knots, which is exactly what it's going mm-hmm. for. And it is so goddamn refreshing to find that, you know, when I'm watching so much stuff in this in the same kind of genre, it hasn't become stale. I can still get that out of that genre. Somebody can still push it even further than, you know, so many other people before them. So many other people after them even. We're yeah. talking about a movie from what, 2003, right? Yeah, it came out in 2003. And so now we start to see all of these things we've talked about and how they're drawing from a movie like High Tension, which I think is probably fair to say because it was a pretty notable movie. It's a pretty popular movie. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a big deal when it came out and that 2003 was kind of when all of the bullshit horror movies kind of started coming out. Uh, There's a film that comes to mind called The Ruins, which I, of course, contradict myself right away by saying bullshit horror movies and then go and i'm about to say that the ruins is actually kind of enjoyable yeah right but that doesn't it still fulfills the idea of wow let's make a bunch of gory movies where teens get fucked up yeah i mean it was an era of Mm -hmm. horror right those were man those were some sweet years for horror yeah there were also some terrible years that's true too that's true too that's why the splat pack matters is because they managed to come out with films that shone amongst the crap Yes. That came out during that. Well, they pushed the brutality past the level where it was usually acceptable. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of new ideas about that stuff. And I think in the same way when we talk about old school American horror being, all right, here's all the sequels are coming out, all the Japanese shit's coming out. Let's just do something new and fresh. The Splat Pack a couple years before it was saying, all right, we're getting a lot of shit, but this is still, we can still make a movie that appeals to producers, that appeals to audiences and push it even further than audiences knew they they even wanted to go. And so I look back, and and I hear you when you say, you know, that bullshit kind of era, those Mm -hmm. those few years of horror. Because I think about the 80s slasher stuff the same way. How many times have we talked about bullshit 80s slasher movies that we love? Yeah. I mean, so much. they're all yeah. bullshit 80s mm-hmm. slasher movies, with the exception of, you know, Black Christmas. Sure. After Black Christmas, all slasher movies are kind of bullshit. Pretty and much. And we love them to death. The thing that kind of happened in 2003 around then that you can pretty much use as a general indicator of mm-hmm. whether it's good bullshit or bad bullshit <laughs> right. is 2003 is about when Michael Bay started trying to make horror movies. Oh, yeah. That's what happened. Uh, I believe that's the Texas Chainsaw remake was yeah. actually in 2003. If Michael Bay's involved, chances are it's crap. Yeah, that's not He's bullshit. He's done some that's... okay horror stuff. Right. The Hitcher, for example. Yeah, sure. But for the most part, steer clear of Michael Bay remakes. Everything else is good bullshit. Amen to that. So speaking of bullshit, we start out the movie with a flying tom-tom. That's right. And unfortunately, we have to come back to the flying tom-tom. Yeah. The, we, the rule of flying tom-tom is tom-tom has to hit the ground. Yeah, I guess that's true. We maybe need to explain that uh, once again. Without spoiling the movie. The rule of the flying tom-tom from the, uh, the Million Dollar Hotel and REC show we did is that in the beginning of the movie, something is happening. Oh, my God, take a look at it. And then we just restart our time clock, you know, two weeks earlier or mm-hmm. whatever. And then toward the end of the movie or the climax or in the third act or whatever, we come back to that scene and you you think, oh, yeah, that scene was in the movie. Now I remember and it's cyclical and awesome. And, and splat. Snore. So that's the flying tom-tom. And we're going to get one of those here. The thing that I probably like the most about high tension, and it's hard because I love almost everything about high tension. Mm-hmm. Uh, the visuals. Yeah. And man, I mean, just through the whole fucking movie. And we see this all the time with the French shit, right? We saw this with, uh, you know, with Inside. I said yeah. the same fucking thing. And uh, even when we talked about something like Amelie, I was yeah. talking about 
Jean Pierre Genet and all mm-hmm. of the the great wonderful colors and weird shit that he. Was I notice doing. you're shirking martyrs, but I'm just going to go ahead and assume you're talking about martyrs. Too. You know what's funny is I figured I'd be name dropping martyrs a thousand times in this show that I was <laughs> just going to save it. But martyrs too. Martyrs the exact same thing. And so we get the the first scene I really loved was the just the setup of that swing shot. You know when she's mm-hmm. outside, and so much of this is still establishing. In the movie's own little way, there's not a lot of establishing here, and that's one of the things I should definitely credit it for. But just the way you have that spotlit swing, you notice it when she's walking up to it, that you know everything is dark, and that's always something. You know, We see that uh, throughout both of these movies. How do you light a completely dark set? It's supposed to be dark out. Is there moonlight? Mm-hmm. Is there ambient light from a house far away? What do you do? And this movie, it's ballsy. It just says there's a spotlight on this fucking swing, because yep. they put a light above their swing, and that's just what they're doing. But when she's sitting there, you have her walking over to that tiny pool of light and then the swing just moves in and out of it. And it's stuff like that that really helps build the anticipation. Mm -hmm. You know, she has that hood over her face. You can barely see her eyes. You feel like something ominous is going to happen. And most of that is just due to technique. I mean, part of it is she's on a swing outside a cornfield in the middle of the night. And that's kind of fucking scary. Which, by the way... Why was Children of the Corn not just stealing from this movie? Dude, sometimes Carradine's brain flames have to blow up Fred Williamson's head. Seriously, though, man. This movie and Carnival, that's all Children of the Corn should have been. And I guess Children, it also needs some of that in there somewhere. But so that's artsy as fuck, and we're not even into the deaths yet. Mm -hmm. And I forgot about Alexander and the deaths. I didn't know you know, what I should be expecting, because the movie told me, don't expect. You know what the movie says before the first death? It says cut away. That's what the movie yeah. says. Before the first death, the movie says get your blowjobs while you can. Yeah, and it's such a, I mean, it's harmless for how I almost feel like making fun of the movie at that point. Yeah. I feel like, oh, the movie thinks it's doing something super fucked up and it's got a little blowjob yep. and there's the head and it's cute to me. It's quaint. Little do I know the movie's going to correct that problem right. pretty fucking fast. We get inside the house and High Tension's been really coy about gore. It hasn't shown us anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we get that moment where the killer comes in and he shoves Daniel's head through the stairs, kicks it or or fucking forces it through Mm -hmm. the the side of the staircase. And I kind of know what's coming when he gets down there. And so as he pushes the furniture up and I'm thinking, all right, this is where the movie once again is just going to be really mainstream and cute and maybe it'll make a funny sound when the head pops off and everybody will kind of, you know, grin and giggle. They show it. Yeah, they, they show do. every awkward uh, frictional second of that head coming off between the stairs and the sounds and the blood and it hitting the floor and the angle from overhead. It is so, I, I don't even know if uncomfortable is the right word. That, that tiny moment there where you get, you know, pushing the dresser up And all of a sudden, there's a moment where it kind of gets stuck. There's a little bit of friction, and then it comes off, and then the blood is just pouring down. You just keep thinking to yourself, did the movie really go there? It really showed me that. And where's it going to stop? Well, that's the next. That's the inevitable question at that point. Well, the very next one, I don't think is any better. No, I I think it's worse. Yeah. And I'm not sure exactly what about it is worse. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is it the, the voyeuristic quality of it? Is it the, you know, she goes upstairs, she's looking around for a phone. Um, Marie is. Marie, who's awesome. Marie, who up until this point has done basically nothing in the movie but masturbate in a wonderful, awesome scene that somehow I wasn't even going to talk about here. I don't know how I was going to gloss over that. But she's upstairs masturbating, having a good time. People are getting bludgeoned to death downstairs. It's already starting to remind me of the second hostel Mm -hmm. where we have all those weird, conflicting kind of feelings coming in. The movie's saying, hey, up here, something sexy and cool is going on. And then the guy shows up downstairs. And so it it almost interrupts that. Thankfully not. Uh, Almost interrupts that. And then the killing just begins right Mm -hmm. there. So after the chaos breaks out and we're upstairs, Maria's uh, looking for a phone and she can't fucking find one anywhere. And the subtitles are hilarious. And where's the phone? And it's really important that she gets to one. And so, you know, she eventually hides in this closet. And rather than the killer coming in, the woman comes in, the mother comes in and she finds the phone the phone that Marie wanted. And then, you know, she's coming towards the closet. She sees that. And behind her is the killer. And I think this is fucked up for a couple reasons. The first is that honestly, that neck slice, 
I mean, the next slice is such a it's a it's a staple of horror yep. at this point. It's, it's such a, a death cliche. What is it? Ninety percent of horror movies must have a next pretty slice. much. The is other ten even... percent are left unfound. You have to get to the Wolf Creek jokes Sorry. already, don't you? It might even be a hundred percent of horror movies at this point. I don't know, man. This might be the best next slice. Oh, I've I think ever it seen. absolutely is. And I don't even mean placement wise. I just mean the effect. Mm-hmm. It's just the right level of meaty and stick. It's sticky too. Yeah. That's the worst part. Is you know he cuts it open and it kind of it makes a little it it flutters. Yeah, it fucking flutters at you before it just starts spraying and it's kind of chunky and the skin folds away and it just looks. I mean, it looks gorgeous. It's the kind of stuff we applauded Rambo for. Yeah, that's you know, true. Way back when we did that show is Rambo being almost nothing else but gorgeous, brilliant effects mm-hmm. and relentless brutality. Rambo should almost be a fucking splat pack film. Almost. Not enough creepy music, probably. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a little bit too, too many serious muscles. about the killing. But the other part, and I mean, it's pretty obvious, it's coming, to, the woman's coming toward her and it's the last thing she sees and their eyes are connecting and it feels pretty fucked up. But that could have been her. That so easily could have been her and, you know, movie over. I mean, if we're following the movie's narrative up to this point. And so she's watching it and it happens and she's holding that fucking phone, right? And the blood is everywhere. And you're thinking, hey, good thing she didn't find the goddamn phone. And that, I mean, then now the parents are dead and the only one left is the little cowboy. Yeah, right. Who's running around. I guess he he tries to vanish into the cornfield. Yeah. Only to be... Hunted down by a what a, a double barrel shotgun and shot yeah, right. straight in the back and left for dead in the cornfield. Oh, there yeah. goes the little boy. Anyway, back to the house. Yeah, and we're thinking, you know, it's not going to show him. Mm-hmm. Of course, it cuts back to him later yeah. because as soon as we think we're safe from that, the movie just wants to rub it. It's not even that grotesque. No. It's just to rub it in. It's just to say, no, he's dead for sure. Don't worry about it. Definitely dead. But this is the moment, I mean, my excitement for watching a film is never much higher than it is right this second as I'm watching this. Because we've already shot the dog at this point, Mm -hmm. right? The dog is completely dead. And as you know, great taboo of cinema, don't kill the dog, blah, blah, blah. But then we see the little kid running. And I'm starting to think back to all of these great horror movies that have happened. And that, that sort of, that wager you make at that point, that bet you make with yourself where you think, are they going to kill the kid? Are they that ballsy? Are they teasing the audience? And sometimes, maybe even most times, even on our show, uh, we're left a little unsatisfied here. Mm-hmm. But now I'm starting to, I, I, you know, I'm almost laughing at the movie. I'm probably yep. literally laughing out loud thinking, uh, okay, he's going to kill the kid. This is Aya here we're talking mm-hmm. about. I, oh, gee, I wonder if the kid's going to die. Right. He's going off in the cornfield. It's just a matter Are there of more winning. kids? Yeah, it's just a matter of <laughs> when and how is it going to happen? How awful is he going to make it? And, you know, we don't see it at first and then we come back. But also, back now, inside the fucking house... It keeps cutting back to the blood on the closet door, Mm -hmm. and it just leaves you feeling so fucking used. You just feel dirty at that point. This guy's just gone around creating this this dirty, murderous house, and at this point, our female protagonist is more mentally fucked with than even physically fucked with. I mean, we don't know that he knows she's here. Yeah. You know, we don't know if that's the case. She just happened to witness all of this completely Mm -hmm. fucked up stuff that happens. And then the guy just kind of leaves it like a severed head that he just came in the mouth of. (laughs) Right. Maybe that's why I feel used at this point. And uh, and so Alex is out of the house now. Alex was still alive. Now she's out of the house. So they left in this truck. Mm -hmm. This thing is amazing. There's nothing about this truck that isn't amazing. Absolutely. Probably one of the most fantastic visual staples of the film. So favorite part of this, if you had to pick one. Of the truck? I think my favorite part of the truck is when I'm watching it drive down the highway, screaming, don't be in the truck. Oh, yeah, right. Like, why is this truck on the highway? Sure. Oh, and it doesn't belong there at all. I think think possibly the best full scene (laughs) with the truck is at the gas station. Yeah. Where... Marie gets out and she's going to, you know, kind of move toward the gas station and you get the shot from over the truck and you hear the gas pump clicking every gallon. Yeah, right. And you're wondering how many gallons does the tank hold? And And it's been such a good moment up to this point because you're almost trapped. I mean, you're absolutely trapped Mm -hmm. in the truck and they're going, hey, there's two of us. Everything will be okay. But you're trapped in the fucking truck and that sucks. Mm -hmm. You have the um, first of all, the sound the truck makes is amazing. It's just this tinny, awful sound. And it's dirty. It looks like, you know, the 2003 chop shop horror room, the Uh hostile-esque horror room, but it's inside the back of a fucking truck. And you pan up and you see all the blood and the scratches and then the the shit in the rear view mirror where the killer was 
cutting out something and I thought the movie was going to do a lame thing where it like tries to tell us some backstory, mm-hmm. but instead he's just yeah, collecting some little mementos, yep. putting them in the rear view mirror and it pans across and shows all this shit. And so you're out of the truck, you're happy, mm-hmm. and the gallons are clicking down. And then Marie hears the thing stop and just runs for it, and the camera shows how far she has to go, and it's so hopeless, and I know. it's the biggest gas station in the entire fucking world yeah. at that point. And so it's just go, go, go. And I don't know, you know, at that moment as it's clicking down, I'm thinking, maybe she's going to turn around. Maybe she's going to get back in the truck before it pulls away. And instead, she goes inside. And yeah. I guess that's probably the better move. Mm-hmm. But I don't even know. I mean, that's that's what the countdown is doing for me. That's where the anticipation goes. I'm thinking, is she going to bolt for the station or is she going to cut her losses and come back to the truck? Mm-hmm. And she goes for this convenience store. And I love this whole convenience store scene, too. I mean, this is something I'm going to fucking remember forever. You have a, a totally different environment than the house. She comes in. You think maybe she's going to get some help. And, you know, the guy comes in to pay for his gas before she can even make any sense of it. So now she's in this convenience store hiding. And uh, Jimmy, our clerk, is hanging out and talking to the dude. And is kind of fearful of him. They seem to have some rapport. They know each other. And it almost seems satirical to me, the music that's playing in the convenience store. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't go, obviously, with the mood of what's happening. But it keeps going. It, the score even tries to, to kick its ass a little bit. And when the score melts away and the horror stops happening, that stupid fucking music kicks back in and you're building the suspense. You don't know he's walking through the aisles. You don't know if he's going to encounter her, if he's even looking for her still. And then he ends up killing Jimmy. And this is what I love is as he's going through these back stalls, as he's looking through this stuff, you don't know if he's just kind of scoping it because he had this whole conversation with Jimmy. Hey, this would be a great place to take a girl, Mm -hmm. right? And so at the time, I'm thinking, all right, there's our female lead right there. She's, you know, hiding in the back and Jimmy's fucking with her at this point. Right. Or not Jimmy. Sorry, the killer's fucking mm-hmm. with her. He's saying, uh, hey, Jimmy, is there a girl in here that escaped from my truck that right. I should be killing? And then I start thinking after he kills Jimmy. Now, what he was doing is asking, hey, this would be a good place to rape the chick in my truck. So now he's still concentrating on Alex and I'm thinking, does he know about Marie or is he just talking about Alex? And he takes a leak and he leaves and there's all this fucking tension with Marie and then he's gone. And so I'm going, all right, he still doesn't know about Marie. He's Mm -hmm. still all about Alex. Doesn't even know Marie was in the house. And that's when we get this weird kind of, it seems like it's going to be out of place, but for some reason, Muse and hard, badass road yeah. quotation just kind of finds its niche Isn't right in here. Isn't that amazing? So you, essentially what happens is... The lead up and the fucking crescendo. Essentially, yeah. Essentially what happens is he kills Jimmy, takes off. Marie grabs Jimmy's keys, gets in his fucking Dodge Nova. <laughs> yeah, right. One of the ultimate muscle cars, right? There's yeah, the just Charger, the Challenger, and the Nova. Yeah. And she gets in the fucking car and chases him down, complete with racing stripes. Yeah. While Newborn by Muse is playing, which yeah. is, I mean, okay, so Muse shouldn't make sense here either. No, it but shouldn't. But it absolutely does. The only thing that I'm missing from this scene is I just want to see the cars start ramming each other yeah, while Newborn is playing. I know. But that's not the film. And that would have probably officially put it into, I would say, I don't know, Doomsday Zone. Yeah, then it becomes too much. You know, yeah. you mentioned the Hitcher with that uh, great right. Nine Inch Nails piece yeah. that just kind of thrown in there. It would have become something a little bit too funny. But this feels like an empowerment moment. She has the car. She's ready to go. And Muse doesn't clash with the rest of the sound we've been getting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously a lot more contemporary. You can get away with that because they're in cars. The radio illusion kind of makes that all right. But up until this point, we've been getting, I mean, it's this mean, noisy sound. It's just layers of increasing machine noise. And it it almost sounds like drills. And sometimes it gets really, really intense. Sometimes it drones in and out. It's sort of um, something I talked about a little bit back when we did Hard Candy, talking about those appliance noises, refrigerator noises, that kind of stuff. And it makes you feel, specifically in the house stuff, as if you're there with the protagonist and the sounds of violence in the other room. And there's nothing else there. We don't have a score to kind of wrap you in a nice, safe American horror blanket. Mm -hmm. We just have the agitating machine sounds. And that's all we get. That's our only comfort is the, the fucking annoying, layered, intense sounds. Then there's the turn. Then there's the bullets mm-hmm. in his hand. And you know that he knows about it. Right. That's the first moment. And they don't make a big deal out of it. He just has the bullets. She goes to fire at him. 
and the empowerment is suddenly absolutely gone. It was already gone a little bit when the truck appears behind her, and then it's like, oh, she's fucked. But she grabs the gun. She doesn't think she's fucked, and Mm -hmm. then there's no bullets. He's known all about her since at least the gas station and anticipated her every move. So the only scene beyond that that I just really want to credit is that final kill, Mm -hmm. or the the final kill of the killer, I guess. You know, they're strangling each other, and the plastic is in there, and it's fucking uncomfortable. I mean, it's one of the most brutal scenes, even though the gore isn't the highest. Right. I think it's because of that that weapon, that bludgeoning weapon. The fence post with yeah, the it's just, barbed wire wrapped oh, around it. Awful. And the way she, you know, she's wrapping it and she rips it out. This is the third or fourth weapon we've seen her take up. At the very least, it was the knife and the handgun, mm-hmm. which were, you know, total failures. And then we get this weapon and then she's not going to use it. The killer has the upper hand, but she bludgeons him in the fucking face. With the the strangulation of the plastic wrap, which makes it even worse because she eventually pulls the plastic right. wrap back up and it's all, st- again, the sticky and yep. the gross and the gore and the and effects. And there's pla- are- bits of plastic jammed in the holes in his face. Oh, and God. It's all just done, you know, basically what would happen is if you would imagine getting hit in the face through plastic Ugh. with barbed wire wrapped around a fence post. God. That's what it looks like. It looks the way that feels. You know what it really reminded me of? Some of those Halloween 2 kills, the H2 ones. um, When we talked about Rob Zombie's second remake, sequel thing, I still don't have a good designation Sequel to the remake. Yeah, right. Thank you, that. And how some of the Michael Myers kills were just relentless. They were just over and over so much more than they need to be. He's just kicking people's corpses. They haven't been breathing for 20 minutes. And that's the kind of that's the kind of fucking kill this is, and it's beautiful. And the movie could end here. It should. Now we went ahead and watched Wolf Creek second, and before we move into Wolf Creek, that gave me some time to cool down mm-hmm. because after we saw High Tension, I was pretty pissed. Yeah, well, and that that and also that we should note that I really like High Tension up until this point, and yeah. the end of the film is why High Tension for me gets it's. Not a great, fantastic achievement in film for me. Because the end just fucking discredits itself it's awful. so much. It's a terrible And choice. I mean, uh, minus this end of High Tension. Mm-hmm. And the reason we should talk about it on the show, the reason we're putting it on here, is it is a glorious, I mean, A-plus class film. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of my favorite films we've done all year, with the exception of this odd thing that mm-hmm. happens at the end. And I was prepared for a lot of odd shit. It's French, weird shit happens, we talked about mm-hmm. martyrs. Any wild thing could happen, and it's not very wild what happens. Right. It's pretty mundane. Mm-hmm. So that I don't go off on a big, awful tangent, because most of what High Tension does is amazing and the best of its class, and I wanted to focus on that, I wrote down a couple short, specific things. Great. And this is all I want to say about it. I think that the movie does a disservice to itself. Mm-hmm. I think it doesn't give itself enough credit. And I know I lobbied the House of the Devil with the same thing. But this isn't that, you know, House of the Devil, I mean, I'll live with that. I look back to the ending of that, and I know we said, oh, there's a place maybe if it ended, it would have been Mm -hmm. a little bit, I don't fucking care. It's fine. That's a fine ending. Yeah. Ty West knows what he's doing. I, who the fuck am I? And that's still true in this case. It's still who the fuck am I, and I probably don't know what I'm talking about. But I mean, so we get this kind of fight club moment, right? Basically what happens is it turns out Marie is the killer, and somehow she can drive two cars simultaneously, and knows people that she doesn't know and is able to be in two places at once for the majority of the film. Best friends with Jimmy. She walked in the door at Jimmy's gas station scared. Jimmy reacted to her, but then she was the big dude that Jimmy had some kind it of It absolutely with. makes no fucking sense. Okay. And I mean, this, you know, if this were just Fight Club, it would be awful. It would be awful. But it would be what I've come to expect. I'm ready for movies, especially in 2003, to go, oh, hey... They're the same person. That happens sometimes, and I can go, ha ha, what a funny year that this movie was made in. But it's not that. The continuity doesn't fucking line yep. up. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. You go back through the movie a second time, and you just have to pretend that these certain scenes didn't happen in the way they're shown you. Completely unreliable cinematographer. That's what this mechanism is. It's as if the movie didn't give a shit about that. Right. It said, no one will ever watch me twice. Let's just pretend... You know, it didn't even bother to go back through and show that those scenes didn't happen mm-hmm. in the way that they happened. It didn't even use that awful mechanism. It just said, eh, fuck it. That's not really what happened. Mm-hmm. And all right, even at that point, there might be an excuse here. There might be a way that I get over this because I was almost ready to get over this as the, you know, the next 10 minutes were unfolding in front of me. But I mean, I'm thinking to myself, why would they do this? 
And the only reason I can come up with is betrayal. Alex feels betrayed by Marie. And so now we want the audience to feel betrayed. Like they were also lied to. I can kind of understand that. But if you're going to do this, don't pull your punches now. The very next thing they do is stop showing Marie and Mm -hmm. start showing the killer again. Yep. Why would they do this? There's no reason. Why the fuck would you do this? I don't know, but apparently everybody's okay with it. I mean, are you with me on this? Would this still pass? Maybe if we were able, it would still be better if we were able to see her and Alex I, spar off. I'm right? kind of off the boat by this point. Yeah, I you really, just don't give a I shit. I don't care what After happens. the gas station, there's yep. no saving it after for you. you see, after you see Marie kill Jimmy, I'm, I don't give a yeah, shit. I, I do not oh, care. Oh, you mean the surveillance footage. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. The second time that they, if there were no second gas station, right. just the first gas station. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that last 10 minutes, you just you think there's no save in that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I just want the movie to be okay so much. I will accept so much fucking French from the movie. I'm even thinking at this point, fuck all your continuity, whatever. It's artsy. I'll pretend it didn't happen. But now you're showing me this killer. And it does two awful things. One, that makes the killer less of this figure that he was because he looks goofy now. Mm. He looks fucking stupid. And how did he get back up? And why are we going back to him? And the whole thing, just I, I'm just ready to ignore it and play with the new rules. But the movie doesn't let me. I'm ready to see Marie and Alex spar. I'm ready to see her holding that giant. I mean, that's the whole reason you would do this, to build up to that, to suddenly say, all right, now we're going to see this tiny, frail girl. That's the big fucking French twist on the movie is the whole movie. She's been running away. Now we're going to see her wield these giant heavy weapons that don't even make any sense and you know kill the other girl or at least fight the other girl and instead we just get the big guy until she's like ready to die at the end the thing that pisses me off most about the ending is that other people think it's okay (laughs) right that for some reason high tension gets rave reviews from everyone as if they've never seen the ending of the film i don't understand how masses of people are okay with this heinous bastardization of wonderful art yeah no one seems to even bring it up it's like nobody's seen the actual film it's like everybody stopped watching yeah everybody stopped at that moment we're looking around at each other as if we got some fucked up copy netflix screwed up For me it's like the theater was showing an extra reel yeah the the uncut version has some stupid ending that the produce you know i just couldn't imagine that this was actually happening that was fucking with this what was otherwise a wonderful movie Mm -hmm. and that no one had ever mentioned this no one had ever I don't have a problem giving this movie a rave review because it accomplishes so much Mm -hmm. up to that point. I don't give a shit what it does at the end. But you can't tell somebody, oh, high tension, that's an incredible film. You have to say something like, oh, high tension, I enjoyed the first hour and 25 minutes of that film. I mean, there's some kind of, you have to end it, fuck, I just, all right, whatever. We, We just needed to say it. So now other people who watch that who are in the same boat, which I assume is actually everyone, mm-hmm. but for some reason nobody said it. Yeah. Or maybe this really is just a secret version that... I've seen twice. Oh, fuck. Bravo, High Tension. You are way better than you give yourself credit for. So now we'll go into Wolf Creek. Can I just say straight off the bat that some might accuse Wolf Creek of ending, I don't know, let's say abruptly. Yeah. Because it does just sort of end. It seems like it just kind of ends. And after High Tension, I don't think there's any point where Wolf Creek could have ended where I said, that's too soon. Yep, that's true. I think the ending was probably abrupt and perfect. Yep. I think it was too soon and also the exact moment that it needed to end. Thank you, Wolf Creek, (laughs) for giving yourself more credit than High Tension gave itself. The reason we're doing Wolf Creek is because it's Greg McLean's first film. Greg McLean is a... He's the... I guess he's the the straggler splat pack guy that we haven't gotten to cover. We haven't covered the Saw guys, and that's because for some unbeknownst reason, we just haven't covered the Saw guys. But Greg McLean is, I've seen Wolf Creek, I've seen Rogue, the motherfucker does blood. I mean, he does, he does the shit. He's just an Aussie. That's really, that's his niche. He does Aussie horror. <laughs> right. No one else does that. He does it really well. And Wolf Creek is a fantastic fucking example of what Aussie horror would look like in, in the survival horror genre. Oh, it certainly is. Um, I might be alone on this, but I watch this movie and go, what the fuck is everyone saying? <laughs> There's this ignorant American part of me. I just can't understand accents. I needed subtitles on yeah. this one, too. Yeah. Where were my Apple TV subtitles? So the thing about Wolf Creek that 
it's it's both interesting and kind of strange for a horror film mm. is that the first half pretty much nothing happens no nothing at all the whole first half of the film is is some teens on vacation they got a camera they're getting in trouble at the bar and you know they're taking their shirts off playing guitar having a good time you're kind of just getting to know that these are just normal human beings and then they end up at a meteor crater yeah so i mean we're back to the days of monster man you know we're doing the the hatchet stuff uh we mentioned children of the corn earlier Mm -hmm. i had to bring that up during high tension but uh, the i think it was the fifth one right yeah what did it have blow up dolls or something blow up dolls for the finding people yeah, i don't it remember felt like the beginning of that or hills Ava have Mendes. eyes or all of that stuff it's just that teens on the road hanging out and later it would completely defy all the conventions of that i guess even during that that point because we're shooting in australia we're exploiting this uh this wonderful scenery we have it's these super expansive shots they're wide open they look gorgeous and everything is really casual It's a kind of movie where you can soak in the scenery and it doesn't feel like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's not art house, here's a big shot of some openness so that later we'll know how fucked we are. Although it does accomplish that as Mm -hmm. well. Instead, everything just looks beautiful. Looks like a great spot to have a vacation. Everybody's having fun. There is, next to that bar scene... No inkling that anything will go wrong. For a while, I don't even believe anything's yeah. going to go wrong. And one I started thing, to think we paired this poorly. Right. And one thing that absolutely doesn't go wrong is anything with aliens or space. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, well, that was the other thing. And I love that because they, you know, they had that conversation about mm-hmm. the UFO close to the ground or whatever. And, and then they go to the meteor crater and there's all yeah. these Star Wars Which Star also Trek looks references. Awesome, yeah. By the way. Yeah, we have, to, we have to round all the bases of sci-fi references. But then the car shows up. Mm -hmm. The car shows up and they flip out. I guess they don't flip out because they think they're all going to be stabbed to death or eaten by cannibals or what have you. But instead they flip out because they think it's an alien spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And so when it's not an alien spacecraft, all of that is dispelled. Yep. Now as an audience, don't we still know that this guy is going to kill them? Yeah. I mean, don't we have to well, know that? Well, so here's the thing, and this is a credit to John Jarrett, who plays... Fuck yeah, Mick Taylor. Right. He uh, he shows up, and everybody... I saw this in the theater, too. I see everything in the theater. but uh, Were I these guess. movies in 3D? Yeah, they weren't in 3D. They were filmed in 3D. Everybody was in three dimensions. I hate you. Um, So this guy shows up, and I remember in the theater thinking, oh, this guy's going to kill them. He's right. clearly going to kill... He's a weird backwood... He's got a hat. He's, he's going the other to guy in the movie. There's right. been three people in the movie, and now there's a fourth person. Right. An hour into the movie, he's going to kill them. Right. But instead, within 10, 15 minutes of meeting this guy, I'm thinking, this is going to be the first guy to die, and you're going to think he's going to defend them, but some aboriginal cannibals right, right. are going to storm this camp, because this guy's too nice. Right. This guy's got all the bases covered, he's got guns, he's got a hat. Who doesn't love a guy with a hat? Yeah, right. Turns out, he out my brain. Oh, man. John Jarrett out my fucking brain, and ends up being a total sicko. Yeah, he just spends all this time convincing you of how nice he is, and you start, you know, you start lying to yourself. You start thinking... Well, maybe he knows all this stuff about knives and guns and whatever because he's going to save them. That's what it is. Because he's going to be the fucking Ahab. He's going to show up and save them. Or like you said, you're even a step ahead of where you think the movie's going, even though the movie's two steps ahead of you. You're thinking, all right, someone's going to come to kill them. And by killing Mick first, the killer's going to show what an unpredictable, badass, crazy, psycho cannibal, whatever alien thing mm-hmm. it is. Exactly. And that these kids have no chance. And they're just going to be running for their lives and we're going to be scared shitless the rest of the film. And once we get back to his camp and I'm thinking, all right, this is where we're at. Stuff's going to get weird. I start thinking to myself, I really don't want to see these kids die. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the effect of spending more time with them than we normally would in a movie. Even in the, the movies I mentioned earlier, the Monster Man kind of movies. You know, we like our protagonists. We don't care that much about our protagonists. But this, I mean, I kind of feel like we're watching Frozen. Sure. You feel like, well, yeah, you feel like we're watching some kids that are on a college trip. Yeah, and they're personable, and they like each other, and they're harmless. They're fucking human. They're people we know at this point. We've spent so long with them, we know them. 
but not to the point where they're invincible because nobody's died. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, this isn't the kind of thing where we had eight kids and some of them are jackasses and one plays practical jokes. And it, this isn't the Jason kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. These are three kids and we like all fucking three and they're sweet and they're nice and they like each other. And I'm really thinking I would much rather this movie just ended right now than anything bad happened to these kids. Right. I just happened to encounter their stupid, we went to Australia, aren't we cool, video footage, and this is the end of the movie, and we're done now. But they go to bed, and after they go to bed, nothing is the same. So this is the convention the movie uses that I think is really, really interesting. It follows one at a time. Yep. And you don't know that at first. Yeah. At first I think, wow, this is really unique. We're waking up, it's just the girl. Mm -hmm. What the fuck happened to the other two? Where are the other two? She goes to find the other girl. And now I'm thinking, well, where did the guy go? Yep. And it's just her and the girl, and they're going to try and get out, and maybe she'll die and the girl will live and get away, or they're going to fight him off, or I, you know, I'm trying to, to figure mm -hmm. out where the fuck the movie's going from here. And they're doing surprisingly well against him. You know, they, uh, they get away from him almost too easy. You know, it seems like for as much as we, we think this guy is the ultimate badass at this point, uh, she's able to get in there and point the gun at him, and it happens to be loaded, unlike he said, and she fucking shoots him, and he goes down, and we keep waiting for him to get back up. I mean, mm -hmm. do you think this guy's getting back up? At first, uh, this again, it's the thing where I'm like, yeah, he probably is, and then I go, maybe he's not, and it turns out there's something worse outside. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. There's something worse outside, but there's never anything worse outside. It's just this fucking It's just guy. that he keeps getting worse, yeah, is what right. it is. Right, he becomes the thing that we thought was worse outside. It turns out it's just him, and he's still here. And I love this because it makes him human. It makes him... Just as human as they are, although a fucking awful human being. He was really nice before. We were impressed with him. He's terrifying when he turns, when he starts screaming at her about the rifle. I mean, that's fucking terrifying. But he's still a human being. He gets shot in the air, and he falls down, and mm -hmm. he falls down a long fucking time. And he manages to grab a gun, but it's a gun. It's a fucking shotgun. It's not Ninja Stars. Mm -hmm. He shoots at the window. He misses. He's fucking bleeding all over the place. And eventually the girl doesn't get away. Yep. Chop off the fingers and it's brutal and awful. And it, and then head on a stick. Oh, God, terrible. And then the other one wakes up. This then is the we're best. following the other one. This is the best part of the movie for me. Oh, my God. It's no secret that I'm a big, you know, I like cars on the road. And cars on the road in Australia is apparently about as fucking awesome as it gets. Because really, when you're shooting cars on the road in Australia... You're not shooting anything else. No. There are only cars and road. Yep. Dirt, dust, nothing. There's a vast nothingness. Although there's a sniper rifle in this case. Yeah. So there's this scene where the girl kind of gets away. She's been led away. They've dumped the truck and she finally makes it to the road. And we see a car pull up. And again, the movie tries to preempt us. And you thought it. I know you yeah, thought it. Of course you I think. Did. Mick's going to be in the car. He His truck got wrecked, so he had to use one of the various other vehicles he just has in a barn. Well, because it's that, that great, uh, again, another convention, just as much as the next slice, mm -hmm. we have the deserted on a road car pulls up. Yeah. And every time a car pulls up, you have that scene where they're staring at the car. You know what they're thinking. You're thinking the same thing. This is either hell. It's the, really the same fucking yeah. thing they were thinking when they thought it was a spaceship. Yep. We're not doing anything different yeah. here. It just appears completely different because now we know the spaceship is fucking real. Mm -hmm. And so the car's coming toward her. And of course, you're thinking, is he in the car? Is it worth it? Should she run away or should she flag the car down? Mm -hmm. And as she's considering it, the decision always makes itself, right? right? Because you've waited too long. Yep. The car's seen you. If it's him, he fucking knows. If it's not him, you run away, and then you're fucked. So you yeah. have to stand there. Yeah. So essentially, car pulls up, happens to be a friendly passerby. He puts her in the back of the car, and he puts a he puts a thermos on top of the car, and then leans back into the trunk. And when he stands back up, there's a bullet hole in the thermos, and it's oh, leaking awesome. all over his, his car. And that's the point where you go, she's fucked. And as soon as you say that, as soon as your brain forms... The ED at the yep. end of that that verb, blood, splatters on the window, old man dead, and somehow Mick has managed to turn a sniper rifle into an effective slasher weapon because he doesn't take the easy way out. He pops the tire, chases her down, 
And it's basically, he doesn't actually use it on her until there's no more fun to be had. Well, I love that mechanism. The The sniper rifle makes it so that when she leaves the car, she's in danger immediately. It's not really a lot different than the other slasher kind of traps that we have. Knowing the slasher's in a room and you have to go in the room to get the key to get out of the other room that's attached to it. I mean, it's that same fucking thing. And so she has to get out of this car and he could shoot her at any point, but she doesn't really have a choice. She has to go get the keys. So it's just another one of those moments that's awful. She's outside and you know at any second that could be it and it's awful. And the movie's shown you that that could really be it. He might really do it. But he comes up close to, you know, to make the final kill. And as she gets out of the car, shoots her in the goddamn back. And then goes up and goes for the closer kill, which has less, uh, less reverb on it, mm-hmm. which I like quite a bit. It just feels a little more final. Took care of her. And so now I'm thinking, great, everyone's finally died so I can wash away the awful feeling this film has given me about humanity. Oh, but that's not it. Right. Then the dude's still alive. Yeah. Whoa, hey, look at that guy. He wakes up crucified and he has to... First, he has to separate himself from whatever crucifixion post he has found himself on. Yeah, that's awful. And there's a mean dog who just happens to be there. Hate angry dogs. And then he wanders out into the desert, which has already been established, is vast and impossible to find your way through. Right. I'm surprised anybody has gotten anywhere at Mm -hmm. this point. I guess they haven't. I guess the dude has always come to find them. And so that, and that's what you think, right? He passes out on the side of the road. You see a shadow and you go, oh, here we go. This is Mick coming to take care of business. But in, and you see the hat. Yeah. The, right. the once evil, once friendly, now definitely evil hat. Right. But Turns it's not out, Mick. Not, not evil anymore. And he gets away. Totally. Yeah, he gets away. The end. And, you know, at this point, I'm so used to everybody being fucked. I'm so used to that splat pack convention mm-hmm. that when he gets away, I'm, I'm thinking, what? This is the twist ending that the sure. movie is already over. The twist ending is that we're not going to see a third episode of this guy getting brutally tortured as much as the other people. He just manages to make it home and everything's and, all right. And the thing is, is that doesn't bring Mick down. It's just that guy got away. Nobody found the bodies. Nobody found Mick. Right. Mick walks off into the desert, gets to keep doing it. Yeah, they make a point of letting you know the terror is still out there. Thanks, movie. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Splat Pack, I guess, right? Absolutely. All right, if you want to go check out other Splat Pack shit that we've done, go to... DoubleFeasureShow.com. That that's, was the website. That's the website. Uh, if you uh, happen to be part of the Splat Pack or you think you have suggestions for directors, <coughs> Adam Green, that should be in the Splat Pack, <laughs> right. why don't you email us? That's DoubleFeatureShow at gmail.com. I don't know who got to pick who's in the Splat Pack, but that person needs to get a hold of us and recommend some more movies. That'd mm-hmm. be awesome. We have a Facebook page you can get on to talk to us about said movies in a... Uh, In a more friendly, social, kind of big brother, creepy kind of way. Mm -hmm. And that's always a good time. And then there's donate.doublefeatureshow.com. So you go on there, you give some money, and then you maybe get to pick some movies we do at the end. We're going to pick out two people who've donated through the site. And uh, we're going to let them pick movies. We're going to pair those two movies up. We're going to do them at the very end of the year. And I'm sure they will both be painfully bad. Thank you, Podmanity. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to do some more movies next time. Yeah, we are. We need to just keep turning 90 degree fucking corners here. All right. So let's uh, go back to the 1930s. Can I just, uh, before we, uh, thank you. Thank you for this double feature. This was amazing. I really enjoyed the fuck out of both of these movies. They were tremendously good. (laughs) I will never get sick of doing these bullshit 2003 horror (laughs) films. All right. 1930s. We're going back. So we're going to do uh, A Night in Casablanca, which is the, a Marx Brothers movie that involves Nazis. And okay. then we're going to do uh, The Great Dictator, which is a Charlie Chaplin movie that involves Nazis. I guess it's not the 30s, because Nazis in the 30s don't actually go hand in hand too super well. These sort of factual errors are what you have to look forward to next time on Double Feature. Watch more fucking film. Bye.